Do you think better together? Okay, here we go. It's now time for me to introduce the man uh, you've all come to see one of the finest comedians working in Britain today. Please give a huge Edinburgh welcome to the fantastic Rory Bremner! Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. That was me, Rory Bremner, about to go on stage to do my first ever stand-up show about Scottish politics. I was apprehensive. Only eight weeks earlier, I knew next to nothing about Scotland's parliament, the politicians, or their policies. So why do a show about it? Well, somebody has to. And having moved back home to Scotland and become fascinated by the debate on independence, it's time I took it seriously and did some comedy about it. And where better to start than my hometown, Edinburgh? They used to talk of Edinburgh as the Athens of the North. It's even got its own acropolis on Colton Hill over there. But if you're talking about a big European capital, Athens isn't a great role model right now. So what would Edinburgh be? Would it be an Athens? Would it be a Berlin? See, I know nothing about Scottish politics. I don't know. I don't know how their politicians work, I don't know what makes them tick, I don't know what makes them go cuckoo every 15 minutes, but I'd love to find out. Okay, what's my story? Brought up in Scotland, tick, Scottish dad, tick, like haggis, whiskey, iron brew, well, two out of three is not bad. <laughs> and being a great believer in Scottish traditions, I followed the example of thousands of my fellow countrymen and moved to England spending the next 30 odd years reminding the English that we invented the telephone, the fax machine, the flush toilet, gin and tonic. It's true, it's on Wikipedia. <laughs> and what did we get back? Berwick Rangers and the last 20 minutes of Newsnight. <laughs> but before I step on stage, jokes must be written. So to help me make some sense and nonsense of Scottish politics, I've called in the troops. That's what history is for in a, in a political context. You have to have an extremely selective knowledge of about three facts. Yes. And then uh, that, that's basically, you just base your whole world view on it. Fortunately, in Scotland, most of those three facts end up on tea towels. <laughs> <laughs> Five writers and one producer round a table for a day, trying to be funny with only tea and biscuits as sustenance. This is a writer's room. I've worked with Andy Zaltzman on my previous shows, and he's one of the best political satirists working in British comedy. Stephen Dick is a comedy writer very much in demand from the biggest comedians in the UK. Sanjeev Kohli is a writer and actor, best known for playing Naveed in Still Game. And Julia Sutherland is a writer, sketch performer and stand-up comedian. It's like being in that marriage where you know, you're miserable, but you're kind of happy being miserable because you can moan, you get something to moan about every single day, and you get somebody else to blame for your misery. That's, that's... You came out with that one very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and then to marshal us all into some sort of shape is Noddy Davidson, my producer. You've you lived, lived up here. Do, does it affect you, and do, do, do you write stuff about it as well? I tend not to, to be honest, for the stand-up, just because there doesn't seem to be much of an appetite for it. And I don't know whether it's because of because people just don't know, um, you know, who, who the characters are. And the only one they know is Salmon, too. I think he's exploited that. Because he does, he does have sort of stage presence, and uh, they don't really know who the other players are, and they're not that bothered. And they, they see them as kind of jumped-up councillors who've all got pork chops in their pockets. So that, that, kind of, <laughs> that kind of level of government rather than, you know, they would still look to Westminster, I think, for the real characters. Yeah. yeah. It has to be so on the surface, the jokes, because you have to, if you went any deeper, you'd have to explain so much. Uh, yeah. Because I think, which is fine. So your audience is like background reading those before they start. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you go. That's, uh, 45 pages. <laughs> uh, but you... Uh, 
to get into some of the details that we probably want to talk about in our show is it's tricky to do on a, on a stand-up set. I think there is that link in the process, though. I mean, I think and it runs through in, in sort of British um, television. People saw their politicians and they began, they recognised them, yeah. even through a comedy show. And it was kind of, but, but when there's nothing like that, there's, then there's only, only the politically minded get to see the politicians yeah. and, and watch them. And I think politics is far too dangerous to be yeah. left just to the politically <laughs> minded. <laughs> Scotland needs comedy more than ever, with the independence debate finally, after 300 years, reaching room temperature. <laughs> and just imagine what William Wallace would be saying now. I don't know what William Wallace sounded like. I kind of imagine a bit like Gavin Hastings, you know. This is a tremendous opportunity for the people of <laughs> Scotland if there's ever anything that was guaranteed to make your heart beat faster <laughs> you can probably hear the excitement in my voice I've never felt quite so excited in my entire life so tonight it's very unlikely that you'll get any answers tonight but uh, the idea is at least we'll raise a few of the questions because the way I see it that there are some things in life that are too important to be taken seriously right and this is one of them so it's time it's time to put the L in satire. <laughs> I don't really understand that joke. Could somebody just explain it to me? It's a big step, or a big flight of steps, from the writer's room to the stage. And my search for material starts, just as the new parliament did, at the assembly halls on the mound. There's a statue of John Knox outside. He's long dead, but I'm here to meet another firebrand orator. Dennis Canavan made his name as a Labour backbencher at Westminster. Stand up! Stand up and fight! But he returned north with the dawn of devolution. So, Dennis, we're here in the Assembly Hall of the Church of Scotland, is that right? But also, this was the start of the Scottish Parliament, am I right? Indeed, uh, this is where the Parliament uh, first met. And you were an MSP that day when it started as the first Scottish Parliament, yeah? Yes, I was, uh, I was the only independent member elected in 1999. There's so much history about this actual, this particular room, because you can see just, just there was where David Steele first sat as the first presiding officer. Right about there was where Henry McLeish was the, the first minister. And if you look in the, in the loos back there, you can still see scribbled as writing on the wall saying, if you want a good time, call this number. <laughs> Don't ring it, you just get put through to Tommy Sheridan's answer phone. Um, <laughs> that's satire, ladies and gentlemen. It bothers me that I know so little about Scottish politics, but I wonder, do the Scots themselves, do they know that much about Scottish politics? Are they engaged? I don't think the electorate are as engaged as they used to be, and I think that that shows in the turnout at general elections. Do you think it's like with New Labour that, you know, that, that um, small public meetings and constituency surgeries and, and the kind of... Um, the real grassroots politics was less important to these guys because they were busy talking to the head of BP or the head of the banks or this or that because that's how they saw politics. Do you think it's that, that's part of that disconnect? Yes, I think that, that, that Blair uh, and some of his acolytes were speaking uh, to the wrong people. Did you come um, across Mandelson a few times? What did, what did he make well, of you? Uh, I don't now, know what Mandelson... He's a very nice chap, Dennis, <laughs> and I'm a very fond man. Now, you and I, and I'm, as you know, I'm a Labour man through and through, and I, I'm Labour in my heart. Um, it's just I just don't seem to be able to find it at the moment. But you're a very, very good man. Did you ever meet him? Chalk and cheese? Oh, yes. Chalk I, and cheese comes to mind. I met him. I, I don't know what Mandelson thought of me, but I didn't think very highly of him. The SNP have been in a majority in Scotland for how long now? Just since uh, the last uh, uh, elections to the, to the Scottish Parliament. And he got a remarkable vote, didn't he, Alex Salmon? Why? Why, is, why did he get such a big vote? Well, Salmon is a very strong character. He is probably the most astute political leader of his generation uh, in Scotland. Not a big generation, um, it has to be said there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know who these people are. I mean, Alex Salmon, Nicola Sturgeon, are there any other fish in the sea? <laughs> I don't know. Yet, let's go and find the people who vote for and pay for these politicians. They're bound to know. Who's that? Oh, she's Sam. Oh, Salmon, is it? Yeah. Who are these people? Who are they? Uh, that's the head of the Tories in Scotland. Well done. Whose yep. name is? Uh, he looks like a schoolboy. Who's that? I don't know that one. Who's that? 
Who's that? Who's that? Alistair Darling. I, I knew his can face. I just, can I just get this right? You're from San Antonio, Texas. Who's that? Alex Zerner. What do you think of him? Oh, uh, um, uh, no comment. Who's that? Jackie who? Why is it that we don't know who these politicians are? Oh, I wonder that's Alec. He's the king. He's the king. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'll see you right there. Do you like him? Uh, not particularly. I'm, <laughs> it's okay, I'm we're really bad with names. I recognise faces, but I don't recognise. Oh. Do you know who that is? No, but I don't do politics. <laughs> you don't do politics. I don't do these things. You're not really blender, though. Yeah. <laughs> I asked some people in the street, and uh, it turns out they didn't have a clue either. You know, show them a picture of Rosanna Cunningham or Ian Gray, and they just look blank. Jahan Lamont, they go, no, what is this, Crime Watch? <laughs> we showed one woman a picture of Willie Rennie, you know, the Lib Dem leader. She'd never seen him before. Turns out she'd been married to him for 15 years. <laughs> Although, to be fair, he is one of the Lib Dems, so, uh, you know, they only meet up occasionally to exchange gifts, pleasantries and points on their driving licence. <laughs> but does anyone actually know what Willie Rennie sounds like? For all I know, you know, he could sound like Prince Charles. <laughs> People have killed you. We pledge to sort out your weekly bin collection. But surely someone somewhere knows who these politicians are and what's funny about them. British Empire don't get rid of colonies that easily, do they? America had to fight a war of independence. Ireland had to fight a war of independence. I mean, Indian independence mainly brought about because Gandhi went on hunger strike to bring down the British Raj. Christ almighty, you can't see Alex Salmon going to hunger, <laughs> hunger strike. <laughs> Paul Sneddon is one of Scotland's sharpest stand-up comedians. One of only a few making jokes at the expense, and the expenses, of Scotland's politicians. And he has a familiar tale to tell. About ten years ago, I went on a similar journey to you. I'd, I'd lived down south and came back here round about the time the Parliament opened, and I thought, well, well the Parliament's opening, we're going to get a huge new lot of political people we can actually, you know, we can satirise, we can take the piss out of, and then found out that it was pointless because most people in the audience would think, who the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but I have noticed a change uh, in, yeah, in this, I guess, over the last six months to a year. Now we are aware of the referendum coming. People are switched on to the subject. Whether they don't care, they're still engaged. So they know it's coming. And so they, they are prepared to laugh about the whole thing. But, uh... There's a thing in, in, in down south that people only really know who the politicians are when they get into a scandal, like David Laws, mm. oh, that's the gay one with the expenses. Yeah. Andrew Mitchell, he's plebgate. Is it the same up here? You've had your scandals? We've had the scandals, but the scandals up here were of such a ridiculously small nature, they were almost not worth writing about. Because, I mean, look at the, the States. The States had good scandals, don't they? And they always have had, you know, uh -huh. from Watergate, you know, through to all the stuff that Clinton had to put up with. So talk me through the gates here. Well, we had Pygate. <laughs> yes, I know. Pygate. Unbelievable. We had Pygate. Uh, Frank Macavitti, who was the Sport and Culture Secretary, I believe, uh, didn't uh, attend parliamentary questions because he was in the canteen eating a pie, <laughs> uh, but claimed he was, quote, dealing with some administration. To be honest, you know, there aren't many MSPs who'd set the world on fire. There's one who set the curtains on fire. <laughs> but he was pissed he got six, 16 months in jail. Do you remember Mike Watson? Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. He can't. Uh, <laughs> So who should I be doing then? Well, obviously Alex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know what level of uh, <laughs> visuals you're going for here. It might be quite a long time in, in makeup. In makeup the yeah. How long does it take him every morning to, think, to get to look like yeah, that? Yeah. Well, actually, what you can do is just wear a panda suit. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking increasingly more and more like the pandas in Edinburgh Zoo. In fact, one of them's not been seen for a few weeks, so we reckon he might have eaten it. <laughs> I might draw the line at a panda suit, but I will need to start with the First Minister's voice. And so I utilised a technique developed through decades of experience, talking to myself while driving. You need to have a listen to what this guy sounds like. Important in our party's history and our country's recent history. To skewer a, a better future for our families, skewer, and our community skewer. and our nation. To skewer a, a better future? future? Starts 
with a yes vote. A nation that stands. This week, I met with the Prime Minister to sign the Edinburgh Agreement. Mm. An agreement which gives our own Parliament unchallenged legal authority to hold the referendum. It's which that. agrees the process, respects the outcome. He's got that kind of back of the throat thing. Agrees the process, respects the outcome. It's game on for Scotland. It's game on for Scotland. For Scotland. Oh, big applause. And that's why I say to you today, with my wee back of the... Th that referendum oh, here creates we go. a, a once-in-a-generation Creates opportunity. a once-in-a-generation. And conference, that must include the new generation. That's two generations. 16 and 17 year olds. It's a once-in-a-generation opportunity for two generations. It's a once-in-two-generations opportunity. And I say to you, delegates, delegates, what delegates? I've got a setting on my washing machine for that. Delicates. And so I say to you, mixed wash. I say to you, the white heavy soil of our future. We are heading out of the spin cycle of devolution towards the rinse of independence. It's impossible to exaggerate the dominance of Alex Salmond in Scottish politics, though you can't blame him for trying. But if Salmon's the biggest fish in the pond, that pond owes its existence to another powerful politician. Charismatic, delusions of grandeur, kept me in work for years, ring any bells? Tony Blair's relationship with the Scottish Parliament was always a bit ambiguous, you know. Or, you know, it was, uh, uh devolution of the Scottish Parliament, well, it was the least I could do. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> you know, believe me, I checked. Uh, I mean, you know, devolution, well, that's a lot, eh? Yeah? Hey, God, next thing you'll be wanting evolution. <laughs> In the words of George Robertson, it was meant to kill nationalism stone dead. Which clearly worked. Uh, <laughs> but like everything else with New Labour, it lasted for about ten years. And now everything's focused on the vote for independence. And the idea is that the people of Scotland should elect a government that's voted for by the majority of the population. And if that works, they'll try it at Westminster as well. <laughs> to pay a visit to the beating heart of Scottish politics, the Parliament at Holyrood. An impressive, if controversial, new building, it feels very European, by which I mean it's modern, different, exciting, and massively over budget. By the time it opened, it had already got its own public inquiry and never got to see Scotland's first two First Ministers. When something is new, we'll slag it off, we'll slag it off, we'll slag it off, and then there'll come a tipping point where it's been there for long enough, we'll be very proud of it, and don't you dare slag it off, and that's our thing, you know, and I think the Parliament might be getting into that territory now, where yeah. we're getting a week quite proud of that building, you know. Yeah, but 400 million or something, and it was, going to, it was yeah. originally going to be 60 or something. So. It was three years late, three years! You know, I thought my plumber was bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If I'm to understand Scottish politics, I need to get a feel for how this parliament operates. Journalist turned prominent MSP Joan McAlpine was kind enough to show me round the building, allowing me to experience for myself the red-hot core of government. Well, at least look at it through a pane of satire-proof glass. So this is the entrance to the debating chamber of the Scottish Parliament. So you see it's very different from Westminster. Wow. It's very light. I see. It's really impressive. I've not seen it before except on television and it's much lighter and larger than you expect. It's different from Westminster. It's very different. I know. It's, it's, the idea was that, you know, that he, he wanted a banana-shaped parliament as, a, as opposed to... <laughs> so you'll be a banana republic. <laughs> The idea was that you wouldn't be adversarial and that we would all love one another and agree with one another and uh, in the Scottish <laughs> Parliament, which happens sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes we agree on things. Uh. Mm -hmm. so the only difference in the Scottish Parliament is that you have to press a button before they start shouting at each other. They have buttons and it sort of puts a little light up and then the speaker <laughs> gets to decide who gets to speak. <laughs> <laughs> that would be better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so you go, uh, it's number you, it's you over there, press the button and it turns the microphone on. It's like being in a radio studio. We've got Alex on line one. <laughs> 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 Alex, make a point, make a quick one. <laughs> Along a beautifully expensive polished floor, reflecting some delightfully expensive timber work, I found an old friend, Margot MacDonald. 
She's a brave and popular character, an independent MSP and an independent spirit. People expect me because I do um, stand up and because I've done satire. They, they, as soon as I do a show in Scotland, they go, "Oh, what are you going to say about yes, Scottish yeah, Parliament?" Yeah. And I don't know what to say because I don't know. And you know that all bit. You'll fit in extremely well here, then. <laughs> so I mean, here we are in in the Parliament building, and I've never been here before. And um, you know, it's it on on the face of it, it seems a very impressive building. There are bits in it that are absolutely lovely, but don't get caught in the dining room between November and March, <laughs> unless you have um, a fur coat <laughs> to, to wear at table. I mean, uh, you were obviously you're one of the critics. I mean, has it grown on you as yes. a building? Yes. Um, I'm, you, you get used to everything except hanging, my mother used to say. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I have got used to it, and there's parts of it I like, but it's not really a very functional building. It seems a civilised place to be because there's, you know, lots of light, lots of yep. good, good spaces you could meet. The offices seemed, I mean, they were sort of quite quirky things to do with design. And I love the way Margaret McDowell, she said, I said, how many people are you expecting to get here, visitors? And they said, oh, about 700,000 a year. I said, there's no toilets. <laughs> and they said, she said, you could see the blood drain from this guy's face. And then he came, they went away, he came back and said, well, we're part of a tourist hub. He said, so they'll go and see the dynamic earth. Then they'll come to the Parliament, and then they'll go to Holyrood Palace, and they've toilets there. <laughs> <laughs> but the Scottish politicians that more people have heard of tend to be the ones who left home and joined the circus, you know, down at Westminster. Labour ones like Gordon Brown, and John Smith, and Alistair Darling, and John Reid. Lib Dems like David Steele, and Charles Kennedy, and Ming Campbell. And Tory ones like, um... Uh, hang on, uh, na na name a Scottish Tory. Tony, Tony Blair. <laughs> no, 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 we know he's Tory, he's just not Scottish. Um, but, uh, but the rest are Scottish through and through, none more than, 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 than Gordon Brown. No, let, let, let me, uh, let me make, make, it, make, make, make it quite, quite clear. My, uh, my father, my father was a, was, was a court minister, uh, and my, my mother, uh, played for Wraith Rovers. Uh, <laughs> But they all headed south for decades. Two of our biggest exports to England were whiskey and Scottish MPs. Or in the case of Charles Kennedy, both. <laughs> no, well, hang on, just a wee moment, you see it, because I think, to be fair, you know, to be fair, a lot of Lib Dems would prefer me pissed to Nick Clegg sober, let me just be able to tell you. <laughs> There's no doubt about that, you know. Uh, but why do they all head south? Well, lots of reasons, you know, uh, bigger stage, more expenses, chance to become a political heavyweight, or in the case of Eric Joyce, a political light heavyweight. <laughs> and then there's, there's Dumfries and Galloway. Dumfries, only Tory MP in Scotland, and Galloway. <laughs> George Galloway, who stood for election for the Scottish Parliament, but remains a staunch unionist. Let me say to you, <laughs> I am in favour of retaining the union. Tell your friends, tell your friends. <laughs> Let me adumbrate my reasons. <laughs> As you know, Scotland has a great deal of oil. We are an oil-rich nation. And where there is a small nation with a great deal of oil, I am never in favour of regime change. <laughs> David Cameron, George Osborne, Danny Alexander, Alistair Darling, I dip my whiskers in your cream. <laughs> While down south, targets for satire were provided by any number of senior politicians and George Galloway. Back in Scotland, they're harder to find. I need to get a handle on the main men in Hollywood. Well, for a start, that should be main women. Ruth Davidson. There was £176 million pounds that came to Scotland yesterday as a result Order. of that budget. Joanne Lamont. I'll just wait until you're quiet and then I'll say it so you can hear it. It worked when it was in the classroom. There's no reason why it shouldn't work now. Journalists are always a good source of material. They can be refreshingly candid about the politicians they work alongside. And they don't come any more candid 
than Alan Cochrane, the Scottish editor of the Daily Telegraph, who writes every day about the goings-on at Holyrood. Well, I do commentaries. When I first started doing it, they thought of putting the word sketch on it, but I, I really don't do colour, I do insults most days, and mostly about nationalists. Well, you'd be at home in Scottish politics then, wouldn't you? Because there's a lot of insults flying around. It's a very bitter uh, arena. I mean, there's nothing like the camaraderie that you have in Westminster, because I worked in Westminster for a long time. There was often quite pals across the dispatch box. That ain't, that ain't the case here, and especially not between the Nats, the Nationalists and Labour. They really do loathe each other with a passion. It's great stuff. You've been writing about Scottish politicians up here. Are they easy to send up? Well, they're pretty one-dimensional. I mean, it's what you, what's the expression? Uh, you get what's on the tin. It's the, the, they, they are what they, what they say they are. They're not like a lot of Westminster politicians. They're not like David Cameron, a rich kid from, old, uh, from Eton who pretends he's ordinary middle class, or George Osborne who pretends he's not a millionaire. They're all self-made. There's no sort of uh, very, very little public school ethos in, in Scottish politics. Uh, and then, then, then the women tend to be as hard as nails. I mean, Joanne Lamont is tough as old boots, high level rhino, brilliant debater. And I mean, I hate these sexist expressions, but I mean, in Glasgow, it said that you wouldn't take a burst payback at home to Joanne Lamont. A lot more women in the. Oh, Scottish Parliament. Then, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's a really positive thing. I mean, you think it's effectively three-party. Well, if you leave Alex Salmon out as a kind of the president rather than, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. but then effectively the three leaders of the main parties, and one of them is a kickboxer and a lesbian, and it's the Tory. <laughs> Who yeah. knew that? That's amazing. I mean, that's just... Well, we, I, we had that with Thatcher, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's the great thing. Isn't that a fantastic thing about Scottish politics? That the Tory leader is a lesbian kickboxer. Beat that, David Cameron. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon, you know, very strong, powerful position in the SNP. Ruth Davidson, the Tories, and uh, Johan Lamont, Labour Party. Three strong women at the front of politics. That's a good thing. Does it change the quality of the debate? No, it's very good because... And, and it was one of the things that they did in the, at the start of the Scottish Parliament, which I was a bit dubious about, but it's worked. Now, there's, I think there's a, a huge proportion of women in here, much better than Westminster. And they do change the, the atmosphere of the place. For a start, there, they've all got to be home for the tea at 5.30. I mean, that place disappears like snow off a night come 5.30. They're down here for the train back home to Glasgow or wherever they're going. That's very, very civilised. Well, it is and it isn't, because it means that the, the, the day's debates are truncated to a, a ridiculous extent. For instance, a speech during a big bill in the Scottish Parliament will seldom last more than five minutes, a backbench speech. Whereas at Westminster, they can talk as long as they like, until the guillotine comes down. So, I mean... But it kind of focuses... I mean, you've obviously never done the school run, Alan, because you know... Of course I have. Of have. course I have. I've done it twice. I'm in my second marriage. Uh, so you can break up a union? Ah. Now, there are lots of jokes about them working three days a week. Now, I kind of like the fact that they had Mondays to go to the constituencies and work stuff out. I mean, if you think about it, either people scrabble and, and do to get, try to get everything ready on a Sunday night and family time and all the rest of it, or they think, okay, right, Monday, I, I, the children are at school or whatever, and I could concentrate and focus and do the work that I need to do and prepare for the debate on Tuesday. So it seemed very civilised. I had a more cynical approach to that one of the short working weeks, thinking that Joanne Lamont, who used to be a teacher, she moved from teaching into the parliament because it's only <laughs> business that gets more holidays. <laughs> yeah. Alex Salmond, talk about him as a character and as a personality and as a politician. Alex Salmond is a sort of guy from a council house in Lithgow, made, went to St Andrews University, very clever, a lad of perch, as you, as you know the expression. A lad of what? A lad of perts. It means a lad who's been around and got on. Okay. P A I R T S. Check it. Okay. He is definitely the biggest beast in the Scottish political firmament. In fact, there's no uh, arguments with the great leader, Alex Salmon. Nobody disputes what he says. I'm sure they do privately in the dark watches of the night or in some secret bar in Edinburgh where he can't find them or hear them. Yeah. They dispute his policies, but it's astonishing. And I hesitate to use the word Stalinist, but it's Stalinist. This referendum is not just about an independent Scotland. It's about a, a belief that for Scotland there can be, there must be, a, a better way. 
So when you're learning a voice, you've got to listen to it often enough and long enough to forget what's being said and concentrate on how they're saying it. So you, so you pick up a, a kind of rhythm and, and, and you think, where, where does it come from? Does it come from, from the throat? Does it come from, from, the, from the nose? Is it, is it nasal? Does it come from in between the buttocks? <laughs> And then, you sort of, once you start to learn the speech pattern, it's the same with someone like Obama, because Obama speaks very slowly. And sentences of five words. Occasionally two. Sometimes even three. And with Alexander, I think it, it's, it is, it's a thin, reedy, sort of back of the throat kind of voice. But he projects, he's a good speaker. God, that's such a fantastic view. The fourth and over to Fife and the kingdom of, of Gordon Brown where he sits in Queensbury and broods and looks down and thinks of what might have been and what should have been and what could have been. I cross over the fourth bridge within view of Gordon Brown's northern retirement home, Don Ruland, and head for Aberdeen. I might be learning a bit about who runs Scotland, but what about who owns Scotland? Just a drive and a wedge from Donald Trump's controversial new golf course on the great dunes of Scotland. I meet campaigner Andy Whiteman, who can dish the dirt on our own little patch of dirt. Who, who actually owns the land in Scotland? Um, we've got a very, very concentrated pattern of land ownership. Um, about two-thirds of Scotland is owned by 1,500, 1,600 people. Uh, the most concentrated pattern of private land ownership anywhere in the world, really, More outside... Uh, yes, yes, yes. And the interesting thing about Scotland is we haven't followed the European model. You know, most of continental Europe, France, Germany, Italy, Scandinavia, you know, they had revolutions, yep. they, um, they changed the inheritance laws to give children the right to inherit land. Whereas in Scotland, we've been kind of stuck in the Dark Ages. Does the Crown not own a lot of Scotland as well? Well, the Crown owns the land we're walking on just now. Really? It owns, yeah, it owns about half the foreshore. You know, traditionally the Crown had paid for the upkeep of the country. They paid the diplomats, they paid the navy. And then as we started getting, you know, income taxes and other taxes and government grew, um, the government said, well, look, we'll take that revenue and we'll just pay you a civil list. Um, so, I mean, actually, people like Prince Charles, I think, have been very keen to get back the revenues of the crown for, <laughs> for himself. But, you know, if, if and he, he has actually been quite active in that. But, you know, if he did want that, the deal would be he would have to pay for the foreign office and, the, and Her Majesty's ships and stuff. You know, because this is Why revenue. Why am I not seeing that on camera? <laughs> it's a lot of money. I, mean, I, I don't know if you've met much many diplomats. They drink such a lot of wine. Well, I've got all these <laughs> sellers. <laughs> He's got 15%. You know, the, is it called the Sovereign Grant Bill that was pushed through by Osborne. He's got 15% of the Crown Estate revenues to replace the civil list. That was passed last year. That's a big coup. And it's like there's a floor it can't drop below, um, but there's no ceiling on it. A coup for who? Prince Charles, so the royal family. Very good accountants. So the Crown Estate is essentially stuff that has come to uh, royalty or the monarchy. It's not owned by the Queen, it's owned by the Crown Estate. So that means that the Queen can never sell it, but it means well, she owns it. What could she, she do on it? Well, she earns money from it. She earns 15% uh, of everything that's made on it and the rest goes to the taxpayer. But that was the deal that she gets 15% of everything. Right. So you could say she's taxed at 85% on everything she <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> She's a hero. Yes. <laughs> Out here they're planning this big Aberdeen, you know, renewable project. Oh, wind farm. Yeah, yeah, a big test facility for offshore renewables. Very important test facility. Now, of course, they'll be paying rent to the Crown for permission to, yeah. you know, use the seabed. Now, if we, can, if, we can, if we can get that sorted, then Scotland's got 25% of the marine renewable resources of the whole of Europe in wow. wind and wave and tidal. As long as the moon spins around the earth, I think we're all right. If the Scottish people vote for independence in 2014, the big question, will the moon still revolve around the earth? That's a good question. I think, I think, I think the, the Better Together campaign are arguing that there's a risk it won't. <laughs> At least it will miss out Scotland, you know. It's not exactly a rallying call for independence, is it? No. <laughs> it's not neat. <laughs> yeah. No. More tax on land. Can we establish it's not a rich area for comedy land reform? <laughs> 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 Keep Very going. pleasurable to read about. Yeah. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's been no better bedtime reading than uh, Jimmy Crooker had some great stuff on it back in the day. <laughs>
king of rich areas, they don't come much richer than oil. For decades, North Sea oil has had a major effect on Britain's fortunes. The black stuff, and the little matter of who owns it, is at the heart of the argument over independence. Getting to the truth is hard. Making it funny might be an even bigger challenge. I wanted to talk to an expert, and who better than Professor Alex Kemp, who wrote the book on North Sea Oil. Actually, two books. Can he settle the argument once and for all? If Scotland were to declare independence next year, would they have all that oil at their disposal? Is, it, is, it, is there a cut and dried answer to the fact that, no question, oil will fuel Scottish independence? Okay, well, uh, uh, the first point I would make is that the remaining potential is still uh, very large. We've produced about 41 billion barrels oil equivalent to date. The remaining potential, uh, the central estimate of the Department of Energy is about 20 billion barrels of oil equivalent, which is, of course, still a, a huge amount. There's still a lot of oil there now, according to oil expert Alex Kemp, who spent the last eight years writing the two-volume official history of Scottish oil, you should get hold of it, if only because when the oil runs out, you'll still have enough fuel to burn <laughs> for at least three years. And it's generally accepted that there's at least one and a half trillion pounds worth of oil and gas left in the North Sea, which is great. It's one of the biggest bones of contention between the pro and anti-independence lorry. It's the source of one of the biggest conspiracy theories for the nationalists, based around the Macron report, which sounds like a study of Scottish witches. <laughs> Hubble, bubble. Oil is trouble. <laughs> and what it showed was that oil was a huge potential benefit for an independent Scotland. And not surprisingly, it's one of the key arguments for the nationalists now. And I, look, I mean, look, it's ridiculous. Just because of the government at Westminster, perfectly reasonable, kept that report hidden away for nearly 30 years, under lock and key, refusing to let anyone else see it. I mean, it doesn't mean that they should get all upset about it now. The report the 1970s, it suggested that Scotland's currency could be one of the most stable in the world. All the world's wealthy would flock here. Mary Hill would become the new Monte Carlo. <laughs> Sean Connery would swap the Bahamas for Millport. Slightly chilly for the time of year. So there's a lot there. Whose is it? OK, um, on that point, uh, if it came to independence, we estimate that as far as oil is concerned, and uh, it could be uh, well over 90%, 94, 95% of the oil would be in what would become the Scottish sector. That, that um, fact that popped up uh, about Tony Blair shifting the, the, the maritime <laughs> boundary. Yeah. What? What? Not, what? What's that? Well, it was, unless it's completely made up. But... <laughs> yeah, again, it, 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 was it, it, it was Tony Blair, exactly. But in 1999, yeah. Tony Blair shifted the maritime boundary. Uh, uh, to include basically they moved it up from was it um, up to Carnoustie from somewhere. Well, but, but that was, I but, didn't know until I read it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to be fair, he was going to give Scotland Basra. That was part of his. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Blair quietly redrew the boundary in 1999, extending England's coastal waters northwards to take in more of the North Sea. Oh, do you bloody think so? <laughs> oh, oh, can't they? Oh, yeah. oh, perfectly legal. I mean, you know, do you really think that I would do something illegal uh, just to get hold of some oil? <laughs> Who do you think I am? If we take last financial year, 2011-12, uh, we estimate that the, the Scottish government, uh, w w w w if it were independent, uh, w would have got uh, um, uh, about £10 billion pounds um, f from, from North Sea Now so that's very, very big. And looking forward, I I've said as a guesstimate uh, that there could be between five and ten billion pounds per year. How much impact is it going to have on ordinary Scots? Is it just going to end up with one super rich Scot <laughs> pissing all his well, money away on a premiership football club? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> also, the first ten years of oil revenue is just going to go to pay off Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tax bill, yeah. <laughs> You're not getting out of Glasgow alive, are you? <laughs> so, I'm part of Thistle fan. Massive, massive. Well, that's I'm, <laughs> I'm Jewish. That's, that's the Jewish club, isn't it? Part of Thistle. <laughs> With a signing bigger than any by Partick Thistle, the date of the referendum was set, September the 18th, 
2014. Potentially the biggest social and political change Scotland has seen in 300 years, the outcome of the referendum raises many questions. Even the question of the question itself begs questions. The wording of the question. Both sides obviously wanted to get their favoured wording on the ballot paper. The SNP originally wanted two questions. One, are you in favour of an independent Scotland? Two, why not? <laughs> when the SNP were told it had to be one question, they wanted, should Scotland ditch the bloated, straggly appendage that's been dangling off its southern border, holding it back for the last 300 years? While the Unionists wanted the question to be, do you really want to chainsaw the Queen into pieces just for the sake of petty political point scoring? <laughs> Even better together sounds a wee bit timid, a wee bit scared to go along. But the No campaign's actually missed out one of the best reasons for staying together, which is that we've always got somebody else to blame. So we blame the English for screwing everything up, and they blame us for being Scottish. And it's worked for 300 years. Mutual blame. We should call the campaign Bitter Together. Are there any sort of actors that have, have come out in favour of, like, vehemently or vocally in favour of the union? Uh, Sean Connery, no, he's opposite, so... Yeah. Well, Billy Connolly, I think. Yeah. Billy Connolly, is he not, yeah. is he not ah, okay, a bit so more pro-union? Pro I mean, you, get, you get, obviously get people in sort of business set to be like Michelle Moan, but yeah. then better together, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't that the kind of the, the tagline of... Don't get back your cleavage. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Michelle Moan sells bras. Of course she'd say better together, but she also sells separates. Hmm. But what about the Yes campaign? Can Scotland go it alone? So this is the wee pretendy part. The SNP's unprecedented victory in the last Scottish elections meant they could stop dreaming of independence and start campaigning for it. There's no question that, you know, the idea of independence, there is a romantic sort of idealism about it, but there are so many really sort of quite thorny, difficult, practical issues. So presumably you're going to spend the next year, year and a half explaining how to solve those. Yeah. Well, with the union, there are a lot of thorny, <coughs> difficult issues. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh -huh. And we're looking ahead, you know, like we've lost the AAA credit rating. Uh -huh. We're looking, at, we're having a, a thing called the bedroom tax imposed on people yep. in Scotland. You know, the poorest people, 100,000 uh, people, 80% uh, of whom have got disabilities are going to be at risk of being thrown out of their house. That, that's, that's under the union and most 90% of Scottish MPs in Westminster voted against that. Very quickly Westminster becomes a symbol of everything that's wrong and independence becomes this promised land where you place all of your hopes and dreams. But there's something strangely familiar about the dream, you know, the chance of a new social democratic beginning free from the old Tory establishment where the country could choose a better future. Where the nation's children would not be sent to fight in foreign wars. And illegal occupations. And you think, where have I heard that before? <laughs> you know, Tony Blair actually said that in 1997, in May 1997 in Paris. He said, ours may be the first generation never to go to war or send their children to war. Yeah, all right, OK. I had my fingers crossed, but look. But if that happened before, it's possible. Who knows, in a few years' time, Scotland could go to war with an oil-rich nation, possibly the Shetlands. Um, <laughs> and then where would we be? Yeah, sure, Scotland has oil, but it will run out at some time, and then we'll be reduced to fracking Alex Salmon. <laughs> so, you know, you're making your case very strongly, uh, and the Union, as I say, is kind of like on its back at the moment with its legs in the air. Um, should you not be doing better than, what, 30, 35 per cent? Well, the last poll uh, had about uh, 11 points between the yes and the no's, so that's a five-point swing uh -huh. uh, that you need. And uh, there's lots of people who haven't made up their mind yet. Uh -huh. Now, if you look in 2011 in the election, uh, the SNP was 15 points behind Labour in January, mm -hmm. and we went on in May to, to win an overall majority. So we think that, you know, that five that five-point swing is not taking anything for granted, uh -huh. but uh, we, we think we'll do it. I'll mark Joan down as a yes. But what about the no's? As I head to London to find out, I'm still fretting about the big question. Can I master that impression of Alex Salmond? This referendum is not just about an independent Scotland. It's about a, a belief that for Scotland there can be, there must be, a, a better way. 
really, you know a voice is ready when you can just picture somebody in your mind making a speech and you're providing the soundtrack to that speech. And if, if it rings true, if it sounds right, if it sounds more or less, then you try it out in other people. It is now or never. I believe it was that well-known independent Scot, the father of Scottish nationalism, Elvis Presley, who first uttered the immortal words, it's now or never. And it's sad that he will no longer be with us to see that great day of independence, having chosen instead <laughs> an ignominious death, sitting on the clergy we are carry out. That is how he ended his life conference. But that is how I began my <laughs> on the clergy we are carry out. Saying to myself, it's now or never, we're gonna squeeze this thing out if it's the last thing we do. Until we finally pass the motion and celebrate this great nation. Thank you. I move. And so we come to Alex Salmon, inevitably, because it is, in fact, it is uh, illegal under the Scottish Constitution to do a programme about independence without mentioning Alex Salmon. He is officially <laughs> the only politician in Scotland, the, the great leader, not so much a, a career politician uh, as a North Korea politician. <laughs> not so much Kim Jong-il as Kim jong Piliwali. <laughs> office at the top of the Scotland Monument with a 360 degree view over the capital, like a Bond villain stroking a cat. <laughs> or Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> One day all this will be mine. <laughs> what happens if the people of Shetland decide it's time they want to be independent? Has Alex Salmon checked that contract? People of Shetland, I say to you, better together. <laughs> I may be an impressionist, but I'm also impressionable. The nationalists have had their chance to sway me with the possibilities of an independent Scotland. Now it's time to hear the other side. I need to hear a strong argument, and when it comes to arguing, they don't come much stronger than Westminster MP Ian Davidson. What you're doing is, instead of look, going ahead with a legal solution, you attach conditions to it, which is a political look, look, decision. I, I understand that. I mean, I, I understand that Newsnet Scotland's position is that the power should be given to the Scottish Parliament and the SNP should do as they wish. We understand that. The Stiff, reality, that, that the is a ludicrous... Is, I no, cannot no, the let you continue is, that. That is a ludicrous proposition to say. Well, I, I don't believe I am it. asking I am you... And I'm about to answer you if you want to interrupt. I am asking you a perfectly reasonable question that I am entitled to. And I'm entitled to answer. Time to go toe to toe with the Honourable Member for Glasgow Southwest in the gladiatorial arena that is Westminster Hall. Pretty strong Tory majority down south. Does it not ever tempt you to think, well, actually, you could have a, you've got a strong Labour tradition in Scotland, and if that was an independent country, there's a lot you could do. I mean, I just thought, have you stopped beating your wife sort of question? I mean, I don't accept, you know, that, that is the, those are the only two options. Uh -huh. Either separation, as we would call it, yeah. or being run by the Tories. I mean, I think that what Labour has fought for, with the assistance of the Liberals and some others uh, over a, for a period, is remaining in the United Kingdom and devolution, which in my view gives us the best of both possible worlds. I mean, I do think that there are enormous advantages that Scotland gets from being part of the Union, but there's also huge gains that we get from having a devolved Parliament. But they'd say they're frustrated by it. I mean, why, if they say, they why, don't, why aren't the people of Scotland allowed to decide the future of Scotland, is the, is, runs the argument? Oh, well, the people of Scotland will be allowed to decide the future of Scotland by, by a referendum. And I think if we vote, as, as I anticipate we will, to remain within the United Kingdom, then we will have chosen that particular option. Just a few weeks ago, the Scottish Government named the day for the vote. 18th of September 2014. Big day. Big day. 2014 would, of course, be the 700th anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn, one of the most famous victories in Scottish history, right up there with Wembley 1967 <laughs> and Murrayfield 1990. Oh, and there's Tony Stanger in the corner, my goodness me, he's going to score, and they'll be dancing in the streets of Drumna Brockett tonight, I tell you. Oh, well. And it'll also be the 40th anniversary of the Bay City Rollers breakthrough year. Yeah, so it cuts both ways, really, doesn't it? I mean, Scotland as a financial market, um, as a financial situation, we would have been bankrupt 
had we not had the United Kingdom to bail the Royal Bank of Scotland and the Bank of Scotland out? Quite clearly that would have been the case. Our, our crisis um, would have been far, far greater than that of Ireland or, or any of the, the Mediterranean countries in these circumstances. That's one of the strengths of the Union. The Unionists always ask how Scotland would have survived after RBS blew up, forgetting that most of RBS's operation was actually based in London or the United States. Their mess, they clear it up. I mean, what people don't understand is that the word Scotland in the name Royal Bank of Scotland was purely a selling point. It was just ceremonial to make, to make it sound more appealing. You know, like the word beef in Tesco's beef burgers. <laughs> it's purely for selling. Why is there no political comedy in Scotland? Because we're all boring and dull. And it's too serious. <laughs> Well, no, you are, obviously, is. but I mean... Thank you, thank you. That's, that's, <laughs> thank you, Mr Kettle. Um, but this is a serious business. We certainly don't want any stuck-up public schoolboys coming north and mocking us. Um, I mean, no names, no pack drill. Um, you but, you know, well, that's here. right. That's right. The, fact that you're, the fact that you're Scottish might allow you to um, get away with it. But there again, I mean, you're one of that tribe that um, presumably an expensive education was spent making sure you didn't sound Scottish. Half or of you Scottish. Sound, well, that's right, half of you is Scottish. So, I mean, I think that the people would, would be quite happy to have been mocked by their own. Oof, well, perhaps this debate is a little more heated than I first imagined. The Lib Dems are also preaching that we're better together, but theirs is a no backed up with an alternative. And thankfully, one side effect of devolution is that the Scottish Secretary, Michael Moore, has more than enough free time to speak to the likes of me. You're part of the coalition, you wake up every morning and you see what Cameron and Osborne have done, you thought, oh, now we're being tarred with that brush. You're part of the coalition and you get blamed for the austerity, for the cuts, for all of that, and you think, oh, you know, we could break free of being a member of the coalition. Could you not just bring the same argument to Scotland? Things are tough at the moment, really tough, and they will be tough for, for a while yet. But the idea that somehow with one bound we might be free and it would all be rosy and different, I don't think, you know, Scots are essentially pragmatic. I don't think people buy that. What they do see is the strength of being part of something bigger when the you know, the competition in the world is only going to get stiffer. That's much better to be part of the UK than to be on our own. There is a third way in all this, and of course it, it's a Lib Dem suggestion. It's called the Home Rule Commission. If you're ever having trouble sleeping, I can thoroughly recommend the Lib Dem's Home Rule and Community Rule Commission report. It and it's, it's a federal approach, calling for increased local power so a centralised Westminster government isn't replaced by a centralised Edinburgh government. But there's a strong Lib Dem tradition in Scotland. You know, David Steele, Charles Kennedy, Ming Campbell, who, who fought at Bannockburn, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yes, Ming Campbell, um, you're the chair of the Home Rule and Community Rule Commission. Um, is this some kind of fudge? Oh, well, no, no if, if it is, Jeremy, I, I, I'd make the point that it's a Scottish fudge, so, so therefore, technically, it's a tablet. <laughs> Uh, yes, and um, what's, what's the difference? Well, tablets are a lot harder, which goes to show that we and the Liberal Democrats aren't afraid of making hard choices, whether that be a question of constitutional reform or sugar-based confectionery. <laughs> yes, Ming Campbell, away and boil your fudge. Have any of you been tempted by um, independence? Are you in favour of it? Because, you know, you, if you listen to the arguments, there are moments when you... Um, do you know what? I, instincti instinctively, I was against it, but since working on the show and reading some of the facts, I actually want you to read some Don't facts. Read it's facts. facts. It's becoming <laughs> possible. <laughs> <laughs> How can you make a decision based on facts? <laughs> we don't need a debate. What we really need is a comparison website. <laughs> Go compare! Comparethenation.com it's true, already both sides are going for the market approach. Nicola Sturgeon upping the ante with a special deal. Vote independence! Now with £500 cash back! So many doubts that it makes it almost impossible to make a decision. Uh, that's why you cannot let facts come into it. Because you have one fact. Every fact has a counterfact. So you can't make a decision based on it. That's why politics tries, is fact diverse as a, as a science. In the run-up to the referendum, both sides will try to win us over with appeals to the heart, slogans and smooth talking. But the facts, 
and the counterfacts remain. And for people like writer and journalist Jerry Hassan, there are some facts you ignore at your peril. Scotland is one of the wealthiest parts of the United Kingdom. It's a, after London in the southeast, it is the most wealthy part of the United Kingdom. That's leaving the oil out. If you take the oil, it's the most wealthy part of the UK, apart from London. This is a wealthy nation which at the same time has massive, massive poverty and inequality. And I sometimes say to independent supporters that there's this point that the UK is the fourth most unequal country in the rich world. If Scotland became independent tomorrow, England, well, sorry, our UK, because still remains the fourth. And Scotland, bingo, we, we become the fifth most unequal. Now, that is not worth fighting over. <laughs> if Scotland becomes independent, it needs to, needs to get to that dreaming of a different Scotland. We can't just be, we move one place down the league table. All things being unequal, there are still many questions to be addressed, not least what a future Scotland would actually look like. What happens to the currency? If we keep the pound, we'll still be tied to the Bank of England. Would a Scots pound be worth less than an English pound? Or is that just with London taxi drivers? <laughs> Stamps! Would it still be the Queen's head, but just looking a bit disappointed? <laughs> And the most important question of all, who gets custody of Andy Murray? <laughs> oh, God, I don't really know the answer to that question. I haven't really thought about it. Don't bother me. It's really hard. I guess, yeah. But there's other possibility. You know, would, would, Taggart, would Taggart come back to our screens as a 14-part Nordic noir crime drama? <laughs> In nice knitwear? There's been a murder. <laughs> so all I'm saying is what's important is to get involved and go to the debates, listen to the arguments and test them on your friends and the politicians. Get them to raise their game, get them to convince you of their side of the argument. But for now, all we can say is uh, 18 months away from the biggest decision Scotland's made in centuries. No matter which way it goes, it feels like the beginning of something in Scotland. Satire. As the first presiding officer, David Steele, famously said, go back to your constituencies and prepare for comedy. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great audience, so really, I mean, they're, what, the thing is that they're really, they're really up for it. Hi there. Thank you very much, that was great. I feel a bit like a vicar. You do, you do. Oh, very nice sermon, vicar. Thank you so much. Bits I didn't talk about, I didn't talk about John Swinney, and I didn't, there'll be bits I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh, I forgot to do that thing about fracking, or I forgot to do that statistic, or this or that, but anyway, we did it. It's technically possible to do political comedy in Scotland. Tonight, a new series of Mock the Week with guests Milton Jones, Josh Whittacombe and Catherine Ryan. Eli.